So here we are. We are going to talk about planning a research study, and this module has two lectures. This first lecture is part one, and it will cover defining the topic and identifying the um, best study design. And in part two, we'll talk about logistics, um, regulatory issues, and ethical uh, review. So in this um, first lecture, it will cover the first 10 questions that we ask when we're designing a study, and um, the second lecture will have 10 questions as well. So I don't have any conflict of interest in this, um, in this lecture. I keep six honest men serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. And I love this quote. I think it captures epidemiology in such a, a concise nutshell. It's very apropos to what we do when we design studies. Um, we ask these questions. We define the what, the why, the when, the how, the where, and the who. So I, I like to start off with this because I think it really encapsulates the way in which we're starting to think in, in terms of study design. So part eight, defining the research topic. Your first question, what is the question of interest and how does the question translate into a researchable hypothesis? So this is just broadly, what do you wanna know? What are you trying to answer? Who are you trying to study? Um, and a really excellent way to start this is to think about the PICO framework. So this um, sometimes is a PICO, sometimes it's a PECO, sometimes there's a T at the end. What this stands for is when you're thinking about your research study, think about your PICO framework. So who's the patient? Who's the person that you want to study? Um, what's the exposure? Um, if it's an observational study or if it's an intervention or a randomized clinical trial, what are you intervening on? Um, who are you comparing? And um, in terms of your C, what what's your who's your control group and o is your outcome and t if you have it is time um, so this is often at a particular age at which you might measure your outcome or it could be the duration of your study it helps you clarify what your question is question two what is the primary outcome of interest and so we usually have a primary outcome and other outcomes we're interested in so what's the most important outcome is one thing to consider the other thing to consider is that we have um, surrogate and true endpoints. And whether or not we have a surrogate or true endpoint depends on the particular question that we wanna ask and the state of knowledge. So um, an appropriate use of a surrogate endpoint, I think is this um, example, which is when COVID hit, um, one of the first steps in terms of developing a vaccine was to identify a good number of candidate vaccines and then determine whether or not with those candidate vaccines, um, when they were delivered, was there any immune response? So it's part of the pathway to actually preventing infection is to make sure that you're generating an appropriate immune response. That's an example of a surrogate outcome. We don't know necessarily whether um, that particular vaccine prevents COVID, but it, we have to show first that there can be an immune response before we can show the true endpoint, which is whether or not it prevents COVID infection. So, um, and now later on, we get to the point where we're looking at true endpoints. What we want to do is get to that true endpoint, but sometimes we need to do the formative work um, in order to look at surrogates. So another example of outcomes to consider is sometimes our disease state is confused for being the outcome when it's not. And I think this is a nice example of that. So our outcome in this case is breastfeeding, whether or not say at a particular age, like one month of age, a child is breastfeeding, yes, no. And we wanna know that according to whether or not they're in one of two groups. Um, if they're in, uh, if they have a particular phenotype, which is cleft lip only, or if they have a cleft palate with or without cleft lip involvement. And so in this case, our disease is our exposure of interest. And we're then looking at our outcome, which is actually breastfeeding at one age. So just because you have a condition doesn't mean that that is your outcome. And it's important to think through what the particular question is that you're trying to ask to make sure that you know what your outcome is. So what do we already know about this issue that we're trying to study? I think it's um, often the case that we do literature reviews, we look, we find studies, we read studies, we understand them, but what we really need to do is synthesize them. And as part of that synthesize, you want to provide context for your idea. What else has been done? Where has it been done? Who has been doing work in this area? Do they have knowledge um, or tools or methods that might be appropriate for your particular study design? 
Um, what are the theories that underlie the biologic mechanism? Or if it's a, be a behavioral intervention, the, the framework um, that you anticipate through which your, this behavioral intervention might work. Um, and so it's not only to identify the literature and review the literature, it's really to synthesize it so that you know exactly what's going on um, in your field in that particular area that you're working in. So, and when you do synthesize that, what you end up with is something like this, where you have significance. You know why your topic is important, what the critical gap in knowledge is, the rationale or the justification for doing the work. So um, make sure that you, it already hasn't been done and there's a strong scientific basis for doing it. When we talk about grant reviews, a lot of times we're, we basically boil it down to two things, which is can they do it and should they do it? And the should they do it piece of it is really wrapped up here. Is it important? It, does it fill a gap in knowledge? Does it have relevance? Um, so you wanna make sure that you're taking your lit review to this level and not just simply understanding the data. So question four, what kind of basic animal or clinical research information is needed to address the question? So depending on what your question is, you might be able to start with a basic study um, and it may be more appropriate than a clinical research project. So it just really depends on what you're trying to ask and what's already been done. But it's important to think about what, what should be there because at the end of the day, what you wanna be doing is filling a gap in knowledge. Um, we don't wanna du duplicate what others have done and we wanna make sure that we're generating new knowledge that will contribute and move clinical care forward and that the work that we're doing will impact our patients. Question five, are there existing databases that can be used to address the question? So um, original data collection where we enroll individuals and collect new data on them that hasn't been collected before is very expensive. Um, and time consuming and it involves a lot of logistical challenges. And so it's just wise to consider, does this data exist somewhere else? Um, does SmileTrain have data on this particular topic? Does, um, you know, are there national databases or data sources that might have information? So there are these data sources that are worth exploring. So the demographic health survey actually asks some oral health questions and depending on what country you're in, you might, as freely available, you might um, evaluate to see if the data has information that is useful for your particular question. There's also this Open Africa database, which lists different data sources. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, what we often find is that data related to dental and craniofacial topics often does not exist. Um, I guess in part because it's a rare condition in part because it's not a research priority of the governments who are paying for these surveys. So we are often in a position where we have to collect original data, but I think it's super important to identify whether or not there are data um, sources that do exist that can answer questions related to the thing that you're interested in or address the particular gap that you're um, focused on. So part B, identifying and developing the best study design. If new data must be collected to address the question, what study design is feasible and will produce the highest level of evidence? So here's that pyramid. Um, this pyramid is uh, just one of many types of pyramids that show a level, different levels of evidence. So at the very top, we have filtered information, which basically synthesizes many studies um, and these can be through systematic reviews or these other types of approaches where we're critically appraising topics and looking at a lot of literature and reporting out on them. The, where we're gonna focus this program is actually in the blue area. So it's in designing randomized clinical trials and cohort studies and these other types of observational studies. Um, we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on background information or expert opinion. We really wanna have patient relevant data for the studies that we're conducting. And so I guess what I would say is that while you wanna be as high on this pyramid as you can, um, it depends on what your question is. So in some cases, it doesn't make sense to do a randomized clinical trial if we don't have an intervention. We don't know, we don't even have an idea of what we would do as an intervention. Um, so you want to pick the highest level of evidence that you can on this pyramid, given your question and what you're trying to achieve. So question seven, 
Given the study design selected, what effect size should the study be designed to detect? What is the smallest effect that is clinically relevant? And what effect size has been suggested from prior research? So the effect size from prior research is something that you would get from literature review. Um, you could also determine this by conducting a small pilot study on your own. Um, in terms of what the smallest effect is that's clinically significant or clinically relevant, that is a clinical decision. It is not a statistical decision. And so you have to think about what matters from a patient um, health perspective or from a patient priority perspective in terms of um, what's clinically important. So um, in terms of thinking about effects, when we talk about an effect size, what are we really talking about? I think it's sometimes it's hard to wrap our heads around this. So I wanted to just illustrate that with one type of effect. Um, and this is an, a, a called a Cohen's D, which is a difference in means um, that accounts for the variability that we have. So in this case, um, just to show you what, how we're thinking about this, is we have a mean in the green um, distribution. This is for children with a cleft palate with or without a cleft lip. This is their mean weight, and they have a certain distribution around it, where if you have a phenotype that's cleft lip only, you have a different distribution and a different mean. And so um, the Cohen's D is the difference between these two means that takes into account the standard deviation. And this formula on the right hand side here shows you what, um, it's a very simple mathematical formula that you would use to determine this difference. So this is an exa one example of an effect size. There's lots of different types of effects like medians, like odds ratios. Um, and they all have different ways of calculating these effects but you, it's really driven by what you want to know um, and what your particular question is in terms of the effect. And the effect size matters. How big of a difference in weight is important would be the clinical significance equivalent in this particular type of question. All right, question eight. For the outcome of interest, what control proportion or amount of inherent variability can be expected? So also, again, to illustrate this concept um, in terms of variability, I think it's, it's also kind of hard to wrap our head around, like, what do we mean by that? What do we actually need to know here? And one piece of this um, equation is how much, how much spread you have around your mean. So how much variability do you have? So you can see here for infants with a cleft lip only, um, just as an example, this gray uh, distribution is actually fairly tight and narrow. It's not really spread out like the green distribution is. So in this case, children with cleft lip only, there's less variability. You can see those blues, SD1, SD2, and SD3. Those are more narrow than they are for the green distribution of children with cleft palate with or without a cleft lip. So there's less variability around the mean for children with cleft lip only in terms of their weight than there is for children with a cleft palate with or without a cleft lip. So when we're talking about inherent variability, this standard deviation is what we're trying to get after. What kind of variability do we see um, in the means between these two groups? Are they the same? In this case, they're different. Um, sometimes that variability might be the same. So that's just to kind of illustrate that concept, which I think is sometimes hard to wrap your head around. What statistical analysis will be used to test the primary hypothesis and how will the data be presented to convey the results, especially to clinicians? So first of all, is your, is your scientific question statistically testable? So in this example, I'll just continue to work the same example. We want to know, does weight differ for, ch for children with a cleft lip only when compared to children with a cleft palate with or without a cleft lip? And that's the, the idea, that's kind of the broad question. But when it's not statistically testable, it's not specific enough. So what we've done is then change this into a statistically testable hypothesis. So we're being much more specific. So pre-surgically, the mean weight of children with cleft lip age is lower than children with a cleft palate only, with or without a cleft lip, at one and or three months of age. So now what we're doing is we're comparing means in two groups, so we've specified those groups, um, and we have specified the, the time at which we will measure those means, um, and we have a direction. So we think that the mean weight will be um, lower um, for children with cleft lip 
than children with a cleft palate. That's just the hypothesis. Um, so now we have direction and we have an effect size that we're an effect that we're looking at. Question 10. So this is putting it all together. So given the study design, which is your answer to question six, the primary outcome, which is your answer to question two, the postulated effect size, which is your answer to question seven, the inherent variability or control proportion or rate, which is the answer to question eight, along with the statistical plan, the question nine, what is the sample size needed? Whew. Okay, so that actually puts a lot of pieces together. So when people ask you how many people you need for your study, you can see that there's a lot of fundamental questions that you have to ask yourself and your team has to figure out before you can estimate your sample size. And each one of these pieces is really critical for that. So it kind of just takes you back to all the other parts of the question so you can answer this one. So with that, I'll stop and um, you can pick up in part two.